I'm excited. We're kicking off a brand new sermon series, a new collection of talks, and it's, it's titled People Skills. And so I love this because I really want to help you. I hope this is beneficial for you. I'm praying for you. Abigail's praying for you. We're praying this is helpful. And see, here's the thing. Our relationship with others is not totally separate from our relationship with God. I think sometimes we put those in two separate categories. We have like my spiritual life and then I have like my friends and my family and all that. And then it's like those aren't totally separate. Because God takes it personally how we, how we treat others. You know, there's this moment where Jesus is sharing a parable. He's like, what you've done for other people, he's like, is what you've done for me. Or there's these moments where, where God's like, you got something between somebody else. He's like, go deal with that before you even come in and do your thing with me. Like, leave your gift at the altar. Come fix that thing with your brother. Or, or he's like, hey, you got something between your spouse. Like, it's going to affect your prayer life. God's literally like, you're, the way I receive your prayers is different because of that relationship. So the way we interact with others matters a lot to God. In fact, like maturity is summed up, I think, in the Bible as love. You know, because Jesus is trying to get trapped. They, or he's not trying to get trapped. They're trying to trap Jesus. The, they're like, Jesus, what's the most important thing? There's all these laws, over 600 laws in the Old Testament and these rules and these commandments. And they're like, what's the most important one? They're like, we're going to get them now. And Jesus is like, this is the most important thing. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So there's this direct relationship between loving God and loving others. That, that God takes how we interact with others personally. In fact, the New Testament, the second part of the Bible, the part that's after Jesus came, uh, is full of these moments that are one another statements. He's like, love one another, forgive one another, make room for one another's burdens. And, you know, I think sometimes people watching the church actually are bothered because they don't see us doing this well. And like sometimes we get it right and somebody just messes it up for the rest of us. But sometimes we're actually struggling a little bit. We're like, yeah, maybe, maybe I do have a little bit of work to do. Like maybe the way I interact with others could be a little bit better. And we're like, my relationship with God is good, but, but yeah, my other relationships are messed up. And I would, I would make the argument that your relationship with God can not be totally separated from your relationship with others. So the title of today's message is called No Offense. No Offense. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you're here with us. We thank you for your word. Would it speak to us? Um, God, would we leave different than we came? Not because we're doing anything, but because your spirit's working in us. Would you speak to us? Would you have your way this morning? We pray this in your name. Amen. No Offense. Everybody's heard somebody say that to you, right? They're like, no offense. Blah, blah, blah. And then you're like, I am immediately offended. I was offended before you even started saying the thing. Like, we, I feel like uh, offense is just like the world we live in right now. You go on social media, it is not hard to find somebody who's offended. And it's easy to get offended immediately afterwards that they're offended about that thing. You know, I was talking to Jen right before service. She's like, what are you talking about today? I was like, I'm talking about being offended. She's like, I'm already offended. She was just joking. But that's how, that's like the world we live in. It's like, I'm offended that you're talking about being offended. And I'm offended that you're offended by that. So, you know, like... This is something we all struggle with, and it shouldn't be a surprise. Jesus actually tells us that's going to happen. You know, there's this moment where Jesus is, you know, raised from the dead, and he hasn't gone back to heaven yet, and he's getting his disciples ready, and he's having this conversation with them and telling them about end times. He's telling them about the future, and he gets into this moment, and it's in Matthew, and I want to read just one verse really quick. It says, Matthew 24, verse 10, Then many will take offense then many will take offense, betray one another, and hate one another. Jesus is like giving them signs for the end of times. He's like, hey, you want to know something to look for? Everybody's going to be offended. People are going to get offended easily. And I'm like, that's the culture we live in now. And then you're like, the eclipse, tomorrow the world ends. No, that is not, if you see people saying that, that's not what the Bible says, all right? If you have questions about it, like hit me up afterwards. The, the, Bible, the world's not going to end tomorrow. And if you're like, what are you talking about? I, I'm happy your algorithm's better than some of ours. Um, anyways, people get offended easily. Some of you are offended I just talked about that. Um, I heard somebody say once, sometimes God puts people in your life who bring the worst out of you to bring the worst out of you. That, that God actually will position somebody in your life that is bringing the worst out of you. They're like, and then God actually wants you to deal with that thing. 
He wants you to, to work on that thing that's coming out of you. You have a coworker, a spouse, a family member, a, a boss, an employee, a friend, a neighbor, and they just they get on your nerves. They offend you regularly, and you're just struggling with it. Jesus is like, many will take offense, betray one another, and hate one another. The reason I think offense is something worth talking about is because if we leave it undealt with, it creates much bigger problems. Jesus is like, they'll betray one another and then hate one another. And you're like, wow, that's, that's like quite the progression. But if you actually slow down and think about it, that is a natural progression. That like when you're offended, like it leads and opens the door to betrayal and hatred. Like sometimes I think we think betrayal is like just like Judas type stuff. It's like all the extreme, like somebody totally stabbing you in the back. But betrayal is really just at some point me shifting the priority of the relationship to being about both of us to saying I'm more concerned about myself. Like that's a betrayal of the way God created relationships to be. And then it's just a progression from there of what that looks like. And so I think it's a natural outflow that, that the fruits of offense are hatred and betrayal. And see, this is a problem because it opens the door to the enemy working in our life. And, you know, if you've been coming to Hope Culture Church for a while, you're not, you know that we're not a church that, like, overly focuses on the devil or the enemy, but, but he is real and he is worth talking about. So we do talk about him occasionally, but he's not the focus of our message. We're all about Jesus. We're all about hope. We're all about moving forward. But, but it opens the door to the enemy in our life. In fact, the word offense there is like the word trap. And there's, this is one of those verses that is really different in a lot of different translations. Like some translations won't even say offense here. They'll say they'll be led to sin. Or they'll, it's like all these different phrases. But the word in Greek is the idea of a stumbling block or a trap. That there's something that's happening that the enemy's like, good, got him. Like when they, when they gave in to that thing, when they were offended by that or upset about that or it led them to sin or it led them to do that thing, he's like, I got him now. Because remember this, the enemy, this is John 10, 10. We talked about this a few weeks ago. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus came that we might have life and have it to the full. So what, generally speaking, when we see division, destruction, distraction, those are from the enemy of our soul. And so Satan loves this. He's like, if they're offended, I have an opportunity for division because they're going to be distracted. They're going to lose sight of the main things. They're going to be focused on that problem. And, and I can put a wedge in there. I can put a wedge in that marriage, in that coworker relationship. I can put a wedge in that family. I can put a wedge between them politically. I can put a wedge between them in their socioeconomics. I can put a wedge in them in whatever it is, that thing that offended you, that, that you're upset about. He's like, I can create some division. And that's, that's where the enemy loves to live. He loves to live in, in us being divided. Because unity matters so so much to God. You know, Mark 3, 25 says, if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. Some of you are like, I thought Abraham Lincoln said that. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln did say that. He's just quoting the Bible. It's like a house divided can't stand. And so Satan, he's going to tempt you in any way he can. But if he can't get you in a specific way, he's just going to try to divide you. He's going to try to divide us. He's going to try to get in between your relationships because that opens the door for him to work in your life. Proverbs 18, 19 says, an offended brother is harder to reach than a fortified city. An offended brother is harder to reach than a fortified city. And quarrels are like the bars of a fortress. He's like, what you're doing when you're offended is building walls. Like, you feel it. Like, you're like, I, I've used that phrase even. Like, that person has walls up. Like, because there's some offense, like maybe you did something to them or they did something to you or there's, there's just a rift in the relationship and there's some walls that start to form there. We start to put up barriers and it's like, we need to recognize that that's, that's, that's self-preservation, but ultimately it's an invitation to the enemy. Like, it's an invitation to say, you know what? Like, yeah, it's not worth it. Because if we're honest, our instincts when we're offended is just be like, forget that. That group, that person, that thing, that job, I'm going to remove myself from it. Like, I don't, I don't want to be a part of that anymore. This isn't painful. It hurts. And so, so we just build a wall there. We put up walls. We're, we're doing the enemy's work for them. We're like division. Like, I, I do that to protect myself. See, there's a difference here because Jesus promises that there will be moments of offense. But offense is an event. Offended is, is a decision. 
Like at some point, somebody will do something offensive. Big, little, I don't know. It'll hurt. It could be real. It could be imagined. It could be anywhere in between. It could be extreme or it could be small. But we have the choice whether we choose to live offended after that. Because offense will come, but will I live offended? If we continue in that passage, Matthew 24, where he says, many will take offense, betray one another, hate one another. Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many because lawlessness will multiply. The love of many will grow cold. I was studying this this week and um, I try not to do this too much because the, anyone can read the Bible and you will grow and, and God will speak to you and you can understand it. But there is like the more you know about it, the more you can understand it. Like this endless depth of learning. And so I was studying it and I was like, what does that word cold really mean? Like what, their love will grow cold. And it's like literally this idea of like blowing on something to cool it down. You guys know like when you eat something too hot and you're like, <laughs> like you like do that thing where you're like, I shouldn't have bit that. And you're like trying to blow it out. So it's like cooling down. It's like that. That's going to be awesome on the podcast. People are going to love that in their ears. They're going to be like going for a run listening to the sermon. They're going to be like, what am I listening to? But I'm so distracted because of that. It's the enemy. Division. No, I'm just kidding. That's not how it works. But he's like the love of God will grow cold. He's like a natural reaction to being offended is building walls, creating division. And because of that, the love you have towards God and towards others, begins to shrink. Like it actually cools down. I think sometimes we're wondering, like, God, why, where's that passion I once had? Like for you or for other people or like when I cared so much about that or like, you know, I was, I was praying more or like where did that go? It's just like not the same. And there could be a few different things that led to that, but I think sometimes it's this. We've held on to an offense. That actually, like, when we grab the bait, when we give into the trap, when we hold on to a fence, it begins to cool down our love. Love towards God and love towards others. That it, it actually makes it harder. I don't know if you've ever felt this. Like, if you're having a hard time letting something go, it, it affects other relationships too. Like, it's not just between you and them. It's like, it's like man, there's just something off. Like, I'm not, I'm not able to love as easily as I once was. Or like, it's not flowing the same and it's because we've put up a gate and a wall and God's like no I want living water coming out of you flowing through you receiving it and then freely giving it but when you put that wall up you're shutting it off and and this I want this to be so encouraging like trust me we're gonna get back out of here like right now we're like ooh, I feel that like I've experienced that and maybe some of you are like ah, I might be in that right now and I didn't even realize it like there might be a relationship that I haven't like worked through and and, it, and I've been wondering, what's going on? Like, what's between me and God? And it's not that he's upset with you. It's that he's waiting for you to deal with this thing. Like, there's, there's so many instances in Scripture where he's like, hey, I'm going to forgive you the way that you forgive others. Like, the way you judge, that measuring stick you use is the one I'm going to use for you. He's like, I care about this. And I love this, too, because Proverbs says that in verse 19, it says, good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. Like Solomon, in all of his wisdom, is like, hey, you guys want to know what's cool? Like, what makes a person shine? Their ability to let something go. Their ability to overlook an offense, to be slow to anger. And so one of the things that happens is when we're offended is our love cools down. Like, it, it doesn't flow as freely. We're scared of getting hurt again. And we try to make it so that doesn't happen. But because of that, we're actually stopping the work of God in us and through us. The second thing that happens is we start drifting from mission. Like God has called us to reach people with the love of God. To like go and, and show them who he is and tell them the good news. And Jesus, thousands of years in advance, is praying for us. This is John chapter 17. He's getting ready. This is the end. He said, I pray not only for these, his disciples, the ones right in front of him. He's like, I'm not praying just for them. I pray for those who will believe in me through their message. That's us. That's, that's everybody who's a follower of Jesus. That's like a chain reaction. He's like, Jesus is praying for us in advance. And he's like, that all of them may be one. 
Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may see and believe that you've sent me. Jesus didn't pray that they'd have all of their theology right, although that's important. He didn't pray for great services and prayer meetings. He didn't pray for any of those. All of those things are really important. He didn't even pray that, that you would have all, he, he, you know, he's like, God, would they be one so that the world can see? Our ability to overlook an offense or forgive and unify is mission critical to the world seeing God is actually working in their life. So much so that Jesus is praying for us in advance about it. So this is, this is why it's such a big deal. And I really wanted to help you because this will help you so much. As much as you don't want to deal with it, it's like going and getting physical therapy. It's like I need it so that I can get the movement back that I once had, but I don't necessarily want it. It's like painful. There was a time I was seeing, I was going to a chiropractor and they're like, you need to see like a massage therapist. Like your muscles in the front of your neck are connecting to your collarbone and they're supposed to be like behind it. And I was like, all right. I'll see about that. And I went one time and I went and the dude was like, hey, this isn't like a massage. Like, ooh, that was so nice. I went and got a massage. He's like, this is a massage that's going to hurt, but it's for your good. And he like dug in. He's like, I'm literally trying to rip the muscles off your collarbone. And I'm like, what? Like, I mean, that's not exactly what he said, but that's how I interpreted it. And he's like (laughs) shoving his fingers in there. And I'm like, this is so painful, but he's trying to help me. And, you know, I just feel like this is what God wants for us. He's like, guys, it might not be easy to overlook an offense. It might not be easy to get past it. It might not be easy to offer forgiveness. He's like, but it is the best thing for you. He's like, it will change how you experience and give love because your love won't cool down. And it's mission critical for the world seeing I'm working in your life. It's essential. Everyone will be offended. We just have the choice if we live offended or not. So what do we do? I have, a, I have a few things I just want to list that I think will help us. And the first is letting go of anger. Because I don't know about you, if I'm offended, I'm, there's, some more, there's some form of anger there. Like, it might not be the anger we picture, like the anger that's like big and red. It might be, but it, might, it just might be just like there's some form of resentment or bitterness or that sort of thing that's just like underlying there. And James 1.19 says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. I love that. If you've been around church, you've probably heard that verse before. But this is a great one to revisit often. And then think about before you post on social media or before you react to somebody in the parking lot or before you talk to your coworker. It's just like, be quick to listen, slow to anger, and slow to speak. Because so often we're the opposite, right? Like we're quick to speak and quick to become angry and slow to listen. Like we start getting into it and we're already partially offended. And then we're like, you know what? I'm not even going to listen to what they're saying. I'm just going to start thinking about how I'm going to respond because I'm upset. And what happens is we get angry and we lose sight of everything else. Like we just, we can't get past it. And I think some people actually like to be angry, you know, because I think we get a glimpse of what we're looking for when we're angry, just not in the way we're supposed to get it. Because anger can unify. Like, let's be mad about this together. Like, we all agree that makes us angry, right? And we're like, getting a false sense of unity, that's not the unity that we're called to. Or we're like, you know, this anger inside of me is like, you know, it feels good. Like, you know, there's something about it. You're like, you're not happy about what you're angry about, but you're just like, it's like your default mode. But I love, James doesn't end the verse there. And that's like the part we memorize. We're like, be slow to speak, slow to anger quick to listen. But it says in the very next verse, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. James is like, you know, that's not really accomplishing what you hope it does. Human anger doesn't produce righteousness. And I think that's a good question to ask ourselves. Is my anger, is what I'm feeling, my frustration, is it getting me what I'm really looking for? Like, is it helping this relationship? Is it building the bridge? Is it knocking down the walls? Is it allowing love to flow? Is it, is it doing what I want it to do? I think it's hard to love people well when we're angry. 
I don't think we can do it. And I think we want to be happy. Like, we want the joy of the Lord. And it's like, you know, it's hard to be joyful when we're offended. And it's like, we just got to let go of our anger. We've got to come to God, acknowledge it, confess it. God, would you help me? Would you change me? I'm angry. I'm upset about that thing. I'm, I'm upset about everything. Like, just be like, just be honest with God. Come before him and let him know what's going on and just ask him, God, I need, I need you to work in me. I can't do this on my own. I need your Holy Spirit to produce some joy, some peace, some patience, maybe a lot of patience, honestly. I need some, a lot of patience, God. And just be honest with him. Express it to him. Confess it to him. Can I love people if I'm mad at them? And I think part of the way we can let go of our anger is to begin to adjust our expectations. Like, just, just check your expectations really quick and be like, what, why am I angry? And I'm not saying we become pessimistic and think, I'm, I'm going to assume everybody's going to hurt me and therefore I'm never going to get hurt. Like, that's not what I'm saying. But I am saying we're more offended the, the more we expect from that person. Like, we have a natural subconscious level of like somebody can do something and you're like thankful and then somebody else can do that thing and you're like, that's all you did? You know, you're like, you didn't show up for me in that greater way because we had a different expectation of that person and you're offended by the very thing that somebody else did and you were thankful for. It's like, I mean, if you're married, you're like, this is a great example. You're like, yeah, somebody else did that for me, but, like, I expect way more from my spouse. Like, and I'm constantly offended. Like, you're not meeting what I want. It's just like, well, hey, are those realistic expectations? Like, I might do, we might do a whole message on expectations. We're not sure yet. That's not a promise. That's just, like, we, we're praying about it. But it's like our expectations change how, how we experience things. So it's like, are your expectations of that situation or that person good? Because, honestly, I do expect people to offend me. And not in a way that I'm, like, super pessimistic about it. I'm just like, yeah. I've, I offend people. I'm not perfect. I'm not who I was yesterday. I'm closer. I'm more like Jesus today than I was before, and I'm growing, but I, I do it on accident. I mess up, and I expect other people to mess up, and I have grace for that. I have grace for other people because you know what? Jesus also said, hey, in, in late times, people are going to be lovers of self, lovers of money. They're, they're not going to care about anybody else. And it's like, of course people are going to offend you. And so it's like, hey, when we just rein it in like, People are going to mess up. Some of them did it on purpose. Some of them did it on accident. But I have grace for that because I know I'm not perfect. We'll talk more about that in a minute. I think the second thing is, is praying for them. It's hard to stay mad at somebody if you're praying for them. It is. Have you tried it? I, I've done it. If I'm not that mad at them, easy. I can work through that in 30 seconds. I'm like, God, I'm a little frustrated. Oh, but thank you that, that you forgave me. Like, I forgive that person. And I can just work through that so quick. But if I'm really hurt, like, if they did something that, like, really, like, it, it offended me. It bothered me. Like, I, you know, it was actually wrong. And I'm, like, hurt by it. It can be hard. I'll, be, I'll start praying for them. I'll be like, God, pray for, I pray for them that you would show them that. They, I <laughs> I'm just being honest. And then I'll catch myself and be like, no, 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 no. God, would you work in their life? God, would you? And it, it takes me a little bit. I like know what I want to get to, but I can't get there right away. And I'm like, God, would you help me to love that person like you do? Would you, would you help me to forgive them? Would you, God, would you actually bless them? It might take me a, a while to get there to the actual blessing. But this is important because Jesus talks about this. In Matthew 5, you have heard it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. He's like, that's the normal. That's how everybody lives. Jesus is like, everybody knows that. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That you may be children of your father in heaven. He's like, this is, how, this, hey, you're in a new family now. We have a new family culture and we love people who hate us. Jesus, Jesus is like, this is what I did. This is how we're gonna live. If you're in the family of God, we're going to love people who are mean to us. Like, not just the ones who everybody would expect us to, everybody. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And even if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? 
He's like, everybody does that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. That word perfect is completion. It's like maturity. He's like, you know, as you grow into maturity, as you become more like your father, this is going to show up more in your life. That you can love everybody. It doesn't mean you won't get offended. It just means you're going to choose not to live offended. Because Jesus is the perfect example of this, right? He's emotionally abused. He's physically abused. He's mocked. He's literally betrayed by a guy who hung out with him for three years. He's hung on a cross, made fun of, and yet in that moment, he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And when we're invited into God's family, yes, we're forgiven, but we're also supposed to start living the family values, living the kingdom values. Jesus says it in Luke as well. He says, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. Verse 28, bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. If you're struggling with real, like somebody really did something, this is so hard. I'm just, I, want, I want to be honest because I don't want you to think like I don't understand. Like, there are times you can do it and you're just like, yes. But there are times where it is difficult, but it doesn't mean you don't do it. Like, Jesus is like, hey, you want to tear those walls down? You want me flowing in and flowing out? You, you want that love to stay hot? You, you want to represent me well to the world? Like, this is what we do. Pray for them. Bless them. Bless just means to ask for God's favor on their life. It also can mean to speak highly of. It means you got to stop talking about them behind your, their back. Like, you gotta, you got to let that go. That means when somebody asks about it, maybe you just got to leave some details out, not in order to lie, but just in order to, to heal your own heart, to be right before God, to, to let go of an offense. It is the glory of a person to let go of an offense, Proverbs says. You know, we were talking about this in Huddle a little bit, about how, like, part of how we do this is to see the image of God in somebody, that we're all created in God's image. Um, and, you know, I grew up loving the movie Hook. I don't know if you guys saw Hook. It's a, it's a movie from the 90s. It's like a retelling of Peter Pan with Robin Williams. Um, and it's a, it's a fun movie. Everybody said as a kid, I looked like Jack, the kid from the movie. Like, I'll show you a childhood picture someday. I do kind of look like him. But anyways, there's, there's this whole progression where Robin Williams is Peter Pan, and he's back in Neverland, and Rufio, the person who's currently leading the Lost Boys, is like, that's not Peter Pan. You guys follow me. And there's like this, this moment where it all comes to a head, and Peter Pan's on one side, Rufio's over here, and Rufio's like, choose which side. First of all, they've totally lost sight of the real enemy, Hook which I'm like, that will preach, right? Like we lose, when we're in battles with other people, we lose sight of what really matters so quickly. We get off mission, we're distracted, the enemy's already winning, but Rufio's like, you know, pick a side and everybody comes to his side. Except one little boy goes over and he like takes off Robin Williams' glasses and he's like squeezing his face. I don't know if you guys remember this scene. You should watch it later, YouTube it, be like, look it up. He's like moving all the skin around and then he like grabs his cheeks and he goes, there you are, Peter. And he starts seeing who he really is, even though life has beat him up, he's aged, he's changed, he's gone through some things. He's not exactly who they expected him to be. See, this moment happens where he sees who he really is. And the other lost boys are like, wait, is that really him? And there's this whole moment, and we don't have time to talk about it because, you know, we're talking about the Bible. But, but what I want us to get from that is that sometimes it takes a moment to see the image of God in somebody else. To slow down and get past the imperfections, to get past the rough exterior, to get past those things and say, there you are. I see that you're created in the image of God. You might not be following him. You might not be doing the things he's asked you to do. You might be totally separated him. But I, I see that God loves you, that he created you in his image, that he thought you were valuable enough to die for. So I should be able to, to set aside whatever you did against me and love you because that's what our family does. We love people who are mean to us. 
It's hurting you. It's holding you back. If you want to mature in Christ, you've got to grow in, in your unoffendability, which is not a word, but that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to become less offendable. That offenses will happen, but I'm not going to live offended. So we've got to let go of the anger, which takes time. We've got to pray for them, which can be hard. And sometimes you've got to keep praying for them. Because you like worked through it and you forgave them and you prayed for them and you blessed them. And then 20 minutes later, you got to do it again. And then a year later, you got to do it again. And it's just like as much as it comes back in, you just got to get it back out. Be like, that's not who I am. I'm, I'm not the, because that's what I want to remind myself. I'm not the type of person anymore who's going to stay mad. I'm the type of person who's going to love unconditionally. Am I there yet? No, but I'm closer. I'm growing in it. I want God to move in me and through me. And the th third thing is grow in gratitude for the grace you have received. Grow in gratitude for the grace you've received. See, I think we want to measure the gap between what they did and what they should have done, and we're offended by it. But we're, that's not the gap we're supposed to be looking at. We're supposed to look at the gap between who we were and what Christ has done for us. Because as soon as I go back to that, I can't help but realize, man, I've been forgiven of so much. I'm far from perfect. Like, I've, I've offended God in so many ways. And it's just like, man, he freely offers grace. He loves me. And the more I focus on how much God loves me and has forgiven me, the easier it is for me to offer that to somebody else. Because the better I understand, wow, while, you, while I was still a sinner, you died for me. When I, when I showed no signs of changing, you still loved me. When I did all those things, you still were, thought I was worth dying for, God. You loved me that much. I, I should let that go. I'm not saying that it was right. I'm not saying it was that. I'm just saying just as you forgave me, I'm going to forgive them. I'm going to remove that. I'm going to focus on the grace I've received. Because the more I remember how much I've been given, the easier it is to give away. This leads us into actually being able to forgive that person. And forgiveness is such a big issue that originally I was going to talk about it as part of today's message, but I decided, like, let's just talk about that next week as its own, own whole thing. I want to talk about how do we actually forgive somebody? What does that mean? Does it mean that, like, I'm inviting them to do it again or, like, opening the door back up or, or how do I do it? What, what are the steps? We're going to talk about that next week. But for now, I just want us to start with this. I'm going to let go of the anger, God. I need you to help me with that. I'm going to pray for them. And I'm going to focus on how much you've forgiven me because that's going to help me remember how much grace I need to show. Matthew 7 says, In the same way you judge others, you will be judged. You will be judged with the same measure you use. It will be measured against you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your eye or in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the log or the plank that's in your own eye? How can you, you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye and all the time there's a plank in your own. Jesus' whole point is about judging. He's like, the way you do that, he's like, honestly, what you need to do is just remember how much you've been forgiven. Like, start with yourself. Like, so much of our, our relationship with others is always going to start with, like, myself. You can't control them, but you can control your response. How am I going to respond? God, would you help me to see my need for forgiveness? Jesus talks a lot about forgiveness. He talks about you know, Peter's like, how many times? Like, seven? And he's like, no, 70 times seven. And Jesus is not saying count to 490, and then the 491st time they're done, he's saying a lot of times. He's like, I love this verse, too, in, in Romans 12, 18. It says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Because what, what Scripture is teaching is, hey, it's not actually, like, reconciliation in every relationship won't work. But as far as it depends on you, the best you can do, your side of it, live at peace with everybody. Ephesians 4, in your anger, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're angry. Don't give the devil a foothold. I love this, this idea, too, where Paul is writing to the church, and he's like, hey, you know, don't let the sun go down while you're angry. He's not saying, like, you can never be upset and go to bed. He's saying, don't, don't just let it go. Don't, don't be like, I'm going to deal with that later. What he's saying is what Jesus is saying. Don't let it linger. 
Don't just leave it there because it's going to cause problems you don't see coming. Walls are going to come. Your love's going to cool down. You're going to give the enemy an opportunity. He even says, don't give the devil a foothold. Like, just don't create that room in your life. And so what I want us to do is, is just be honest and, like, acknowledge we've all been offended, little things, big things. Our parents have done things. Our friends have done things. Somebody didn't meet an expectation or they did something actively that hurt us or whatever it might be. I just want us to have a moment where we just release that to God. God, I don't, I don't want to not be able to love as well because I'm holding on to this thing. I want your love flowing in me, through me. I want my love to, to be hot, not cooling down. I, I want to represent you well. I, I have family members and friends who need Jesus, and I don't want them to be like, I don't see them living out what they say they're going to live. I, I want to represent you well, God. So will you help me? Because it's hard. God, will you help me? And so I just want us to pray that together. If that's, if that's you this morning, if there's somebody that pops in your mind or a, or a bunch of people or, or whatever it is, just hold your hands out in front of you just as a sign of surrender. And I want to just pray for all of us. God, we desperately need you. We can't do this on our own. We can try. We can work towards it. But God, we're asking for your help, that your spirit would help us to forgive God, that you'd help that anger to, to go away, Lord. That, God, I pray that in this moment, family relationships would begin to become healthier. God, that people who've been hurt would find healing because love is flowing freely. That there might be a person in your life, God, I'm praying for those people who have somebody in their life who there's distance. I pray that, that they would just notice a difference. God, that... that we're loving them better because you're, you're freeing us from these walls we've built. God, would you knock down the walls? Would you forgive us for not forgiving? God, would you meet us right in this place? We pray for that person. God, we ask that you would do what only you can do in their life, that you would bless them, that they would begin to follow you, that they would, they would love you and know you, and God, that you would just do a work. God, would you work in my own heart? Would you work in each one of us to be less offendable, to be more loving, to focus on the grace that you've given us and offer that freely to others so that we could reflect you well to the people around us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Maybe, maybe you're here and you've actually never received that forgiveness from God. You're like, man, there's no way I'm forgiving other people. And like, I think, you know, if you're not following God, this... This isn't even something he's asking you to do yet. The first step is receiving the forgiveness he offers you. Like I'm talking about family values. I'm talking about how we live in the kingdom of God. If, you, if you're not a follower yet, this is the day to do it. Like don't let that moment pass because here's the thing. God sees your imperfections. He sees the thoughts that you, you think no one would know that even you yourself wish you didn't know about. He sees the things you've done, the worst moments of your worst days. And he says, I still love you. I love you so much that I sent Jesus to pay the punishment for that so that you could be in relationship with me, that you could experience grace and healing and forgiveness and step into new life. And if that's you, if you've never prayed that, I, I want you to step into the family of God today. It's as simple as acknowledging that he died for you, confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart that he is Lord and Savior, that he's forgiven and done everything you need to be in relationship and saying, God, I'm asking you to forgive me. I'm gonna follow you. I'm gonna live for you now. In that moment, he puts his Holy Spirit in you as a, a seal, as a marker saying, that person is mine now. So that's you this morning. I just want you to pray this with me in your own words, in your own heart. God, forgive me for the ways I've messed up, for the things I've done to other people, the ways I've, I've done things on my own and, and not followed you. Would you make me new? Would you fill me with your Holy Spirit? God, would I experience peace and love in this moment like I never have before as you accept me into your family? Would I live for you for the rest of my life? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.